Hi guys, so welcome to the last lecture of the semester. Sorry it's a little late, again I got stuck doing stuff for 366, so I didn't quite get to this. Uh, but this is a pretty exciting um, blockchain, it's a pretty interesting idea. I first heard about it on the Epicenter podcast, so if you guys are curious about blockchains, I recommend you dive into that. Um, and then I read the white paper and it was actually quite confusing. So I had to go back to the epicenter to figure out, try to figure out what is actually being, what is actually going on in Solana. Um, I think I have it right. There's some questions that are still outstanding, but I think we can get most of it explained. So, all right, their goal, and by the way, it's a really interesting epicenter and the guy has a really interesting perspective on building large performance systems on hardware. So um, I actually recommend you guys go and listen to that. So, all right, the goal in Solana is to increase the transaction throughput, which is basically the goal of any blockchain so that we can do decentralized uh, transactions and smart contracts as quickly as possible with as big a scale as possible and start replacing centralized systems like Visa, cloud computing, etc. All right. Um, and so they look at the bottleneck to this whole endeavor as the network. Um, and the way this appears is that um, blockchains basically avoid forks by synchronizing block production. And so we see this in proof of work blockchains like Bitcoin, where blocks are generated every 10 minutes and 10 minutes is sufficiently long for everyone to learn of a new block before they are able to produce their own block and thereby producing a fork, right? So we want to avoid forks by giving the chance to, for somebody to come up with a block, then disseminate it to the rest of the network and uh, thereby letting everybody work off the new block instead of uh, during the dissemination time, kind of creating their own block and thereby creating a chain uh, as a fork in the chain. Okay. Uh, proof of stake blockchains do something similar in, in terms that they do synchronize and in a way that they produce a block and then they produce and then they elect a new leader and then they produce the next block and the next leader. And so the downside of the synchronization is that not 100% of the time uh, is used for block validation, meaning that I get a new block as a miner, I go through it and I try to validate what's in it and then I wait for the next block. I wait until someone else solves the proof of work problem or I wait until there is a new election for a proof of stake uh, block creator. Okay, so ideally we want to use, um, we want to avoid this waiting time and the way to deal with this is to incre increase, um, either increase bandwidth or, or use bandwidth more efficiently. Um, all right, so the objectives behind Solana, um, the objectives behind Solana are to fully utilize network bandwidth and to avoid synchronization between blocks. Um, and the way they want to do it is using something called proof of time or proof of history. All right, so let's talk about the, pr the proof of history mechanism. So their observation is that you can kind of create a, a proof that some time has elapsed by recursively hashing a particular value. So you can start with some starting string or whatever that might be, some random string, and then you hash it and hash one is equal to the hash operation on the starting string. Okay, cool, so we get a hash two, hash one. To get hash two, you simply hash hash one. And then you can do the same thing with hash three, but now we have some transaction that we also want to record. So hash three will be the hash operation of hash two with the hash of the transaction included. Okay, so we're hashing both hash two and the hash of, transaction, of the transaction as input. Okay, now we get hash three and we can keep doing this process to get hash 10 from hash nine and hash 20 from hash 19. And so you're basically with each hash creating a proof that some work has elapsed um, to produce that hash. Now that work can be different on different processors, but you're at least proving that your processor is working hard enough to uh, create a series of hashes, meaning that you are in fact working and proving to that some time is elapsing on your process on your processor. Okay, so that's cool. Um, so if you look at how this process is implemented, 
those hashes have to be produced sequentially. And that means they have to be produced in a single core. You can't really start working on hash two until you have computed the hash of, until you've computed hash one. So it doesn't really matter how many cores you have to produce this chain of hashes, you're just using a single core. And it's interesting in the speed of the hashing depends on the manufacturing process of a chip. Okay, so this is something I learned from the podcast, where basically the hashing function is implemented in hardware as an assembly instruction. And the speed of that assembly instruction is related to the manufacturing process, or so basically 45 nanometers, 30 nanometers, whatever, whatever the latest generation of chip is. And the guy argues that it's really hard to produce faster hashing hardware within the same uh, manufacturing technology. I mean, you could produce a more complicated circuit, um, but then that complicated circuit would produce, would, uh, I mean, you could produce a circuit that uses more power to go faster, but that means that that circuit would have to be larger uh, to dissipate that power under the current manufacturing technology. And to create a circuit that dissipates more power, it would need to have more area, which means the wires would be longer, which means that your, uh, your uh, circuit would not actually be faster, okay? So it doesn't matter if I have like a super beefy chip or a uh, cell phone chip or a laptop chip, as long as they're using the same manufacturing technology, the speed of the single hash is actually going to be uh, comparable, very comparable on those chips, okay? So kind of the hashing speed is sort of this great equalizer. Now you can say, well, we can hash on multiple cores on a GPU. Yes, you can, but only when you're trying to guess hashes in proof of work. When you're trying to do this sequential computation, you can't actually use more than one core at a time. Okay, the nice thing about this hashing history though is that it can be verified in parallel on a GPU. Okay, so um, because we know the starting hash, so for example, to compute hash 11, you need to know hash 10 as input data, we can divide this history of 20 hashes onto two cores. The first core verifies starts at hash one and keeps going till hash 10. And the second core starts at hash 10, which is already known because it's, it's been computed, which is verifying at this point, and keep going through hash 11, hash 12, etc. So if you have a, you know, a thousand cores, you can divide a history a thousand ways with different starting points. So the verification can be very fast um, while the creation is slow because it relies on a single chip. All right, so the way they create a blockchain out of this is by having a miner create this, trend, this, this series of transactions and closing it off roughly about 400 milliseconds. That's, that's their goal. So the way they measure 400 milliseconds is uh, roughly in, or basically they measure it in the number of, hashes that have been computed, okay? So they say after, I don't know, 4,000 hashes or whatever it is, uh, a miner can close a block, okay? And for uh, closing that block, the miner gets some, some tokens, um, just, like in a, just like when you create a block, and it also gets to retain some of the transaction fees, okay? When the miner creates or closes that block, the miner sends that block to other nodes to other verifiers who can now use their GPUs and they have to have GPUs in this blockchain to verify that block. So a, so a verifier could get blocks, close blocks from many other miners, presumably, and verify them very quickly, okay? And so now once a block has enough signatures on it, about two, uh, more than two thirds of the nodes in the network agree that yes, this is a correct block, now, we have consensus that block is finalized and everyone can use the values that are in it. All right, so let's look what this block looks like. And this was something that really wasn't clear in the paper and I think it's a little bit clearer in the podcast. So can we have multiple leaders in parallel or basically multiple nodes creating blocks? And I think the answer to this is yes. So the way this works, I think is that let's say that a miner closes a block every every uh, three hashes. Okay, so we kind of have this history here um, up top. So after three hashes, the blue the blue leader sends the closed block to other 
um, to other miners. And those miners include the hash of the closed block in their hashing process. Okay, so just like they can include the hash of the transaction, they will now include the hash of the, of the closed block. Okay? And when you can see that enough other miners have uh, voted on this block, then that block is, is finalized, right? And so somebody in, the, in one of the red chains can send their finalized block to uh, the blue uh, hashing process and then the blue hashing process kind of verifies it, voting on it, that it's correct. Okay, so I think what gets created in Solana is this uh, sort of a multi-chain with links between it. You can call it a lattice. It's actually not that different from IOTA in its in its structure, though the mechanism is is a little bit different. Okay, Solana also has some interesting mechanisms around incentives. So miners will periodically produce bad hashes and send those out for verification to basically force the verifiers to go through the, through the block being closed and verify that, it's, um, that it has been closed correctly, that there's no bad transactions in it, right? So, so miners will produce bad blocks to, to test the honesty of the verifiers. And the verifiers will vote on um, blocks by staking some, some money or bonding it as they describe it in the paper and basically locking that money for some amount of time. So if someone sends me a block and there's no other signatures on that block, um, I don't really know if it's good or bad. I think it's good, I verified it, and I think I want to put some stake behind it, but I'm not really sure. It could be that um, you know this block is valid, but it's actually not going to be, um, but it could be that it's a double spending attack. So, so I can only tell that it's invalid with respect to another block that maybe has been produced in parallel. So I'm gonna vote on this block provisionally because I don't really know that much about it yet. So I'm going to lock, if I'm the first vote, I'm going to lock my voting um, uh, coins for the next two blocks, okay? Then somebody else sees that I voted on it, okay? And they see, well, someone else voted on it. I don't really know either. It's kind of early on, but there are already some votes on that block. So I'm gonna vote for it. And because I'm the second, because someone else has already voted on it, I'm the second one, then that forces me to lock my um, coins for four blocks. Okay? So this process goes on, and the later you are in the voting process, the more information you have that a network is actually lining up, lining up behind this block being correct, and therefore you're risking less, and so the mechanism forces you to lock your coins for a longer amount of time. Right, so so basically, eventually, when you know a lot, you can lock your coins for like years, and you know you're willing to do that because pretty much we we already have consensus on this block, so you're not actually uh, risking that much that you're voting on the wrong chain. Okay? So that's kind of the incentive mechanism. Now, one weird thing about about this that I've observed uh, in reading the paper is that verifiers are forced to commit their vote within something like 500 milliseconds, within some timeout. Okay? And in the paper they say that the, uh, the timeout has to be long enough that miners can reasonably produce a vote during that time, but it has to be short enough that they can't observe other people's votes. Right? So if I see if other people are voting yes, I can just say yes without actually doing the work of verifying it myself. And I think that that timeout would actually be pretty difficult to set correctly and they don't actually explain how to do it. They kind of punt on it. So that's basically the nutshell of it. There's a lot more in the paper about proof of stake and other stuff, but it's not actually that important because we've seen similar solutions in other papers. Um, the really cool thing about it here is that all the miners can basically accept transactions and produce their own uh, hashing chains and they can prove to others that they are able to close a block once they've mined enough, right? Or once enough time has passed. So once, they, once their hashing chain is long enough, they can close it into a block. And then everyone receiving that block can say, yep, there's enough hashes in it. They must have done the work. We can verify it. 
But now the verification can be really, really fast because it can actually be paralyzed. So instead of having one block produced at a time, you have all the miners, um, or maybe some large set of miners, uh, creating these blocks in parallel um, and then getting other miners to, to sign on to that, uh, to sign on to those finalized blocks, uh, those uh, finished blocks. So um, it's also pretty cool because in Bitcoin and in other systems, you don't really have consensus until you say, you know, it's six blocks deep or six blocks deep or some number of blocks deep. This is particularly painful to, to kind of reach finality of consensus in, in uh, systems like IOTA. But in this system, once you have two thirds of the network vote on a block and sign it, well, then it's finalized right there. So you have this very crisp notion of finality. All right, so uh, that wraps Solana up. Uh, and I wanna thank you guys for participating with me in this course, even though Corona kind of derailed it for a little bit. Um, I will hopefully, it looks like, it's getting closer to it, be teaching a full course on blockchains in the spring. So I would encourage all of you to, to come and join me for that. Um, and we will go a lot deeper into the different blockchains instead of just uh, giving an hour to, to each one. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, have a great summer.